and you are now recording. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, welcome back, everybody, to the uh, October 7th, 2022 meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, uh, and I uh, hope everybody's doing well. I don't, um, we have a quorum, which is great, and we have uh, just a couple people maybe in, in the uh, public attendees, or just one at the moment, it looks like, but maybe more will join us. Um, there's uh, actually, it looks like Chris may be in, the, in that category at this point, Stephanie, so maybe move her into the panelist room when you get a chance, but, um, uh, but great. Um, hope everybody's doing well. And um, thanks, Stephanie, for pulling the agenda together and the uh, meeting documents that were distributed this morning, so maybe didn't have a long time to look at those, but um, let's start through the agenda, uh, which I will get in front of me, sorry. Um, it's open in one of these windows and I'm sure it's the uh, minutes to start. Um, yep, so um, we actually have, well, let me first say that um, uh, Laura, uh, you're on tap for minutes today. Uh, did that work for you? Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, and just to set the stage, that that means we cycled once through everybody on the minute. So we're back to uh, Bob, um, hopefully feeling better two weeks from now. Um, and you're on tap for the minutes then for the next, next meeting. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, as you recall, we have two sets of minutes to uh, comment on and, and approve, uh, which were both distributed today. So two meetings ago and then last meeting. Um, uh, has Have people had a chance to review them? Um, and would we be ready to vote on them or does anybody have any comments? Let's go with the first one first, the October 5th, sorry, reading the wrong thing. Uh, What's eight? August? <laughs> no, that's uh, August 31st. August 31st. Uh, uh, August 31st, minutes first. Um, anybody have any questions or comments or requests for any amendments on that? If helpful, we can bring them up on the screen, but um, if not, we don't need to. <clears throat> let me let me know if anybody wants to see them. Okay. Um, without seemingly any comments on on the minutes themselves, uh, might we hear a, mo a motion to accept the minutes? I will. Okay. Uh, I, I was, uh, sorry, Martha, I saw Janet's hand go up first. Okay, so. that's fine. I'll second that. <laughs> okay, so we'll I still move with... to accept the minutes. Yes. Right, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if a hand trumps a, uh, a voice, but <laughs> the hand went up first. So uh, <laughs> Janet will uh, has provided a motion to accept the minutes. And Martha, you seconding that? Yes, I second the motion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so right. we'll need a voice vote for approval. So I'll start with um, Jack. Approve. Bob? Yes. Brigger? Yes. Hannah? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Paglia Rulo? Aye. Okay. The minutes are approved. Great. Um, and then um, uh, maybe fresher in our minds is two weeks ago. Uh, so we had the minutes from September 23rd, uh, mm -hmm. also distributed this morning. Um, any thoughts or comments on those minutes or requests for edits or modifications or to put them up on the screen. Oh. Can someone just, I'm sorry, who, who made the motion to approve the last minutes? Yeah, that was Janet, Janet. seconded by Martha. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do we have a motion to accept the minutes from September 23rd? Can somebody tell me what the red, this text in red means? That's a good question. Uh, Let me open them and take a look. Yeah. What's it? 
think it was on the the questions for the mm -hmm. attorney and it, i think it was what maybe what you had added duane or what people had it's, added from the previous uh meeting is that if, right if i could martha those were the um additions that janet had made oh okay 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 thank and you. so those were the ones that were pending discussion All right. Is that um, satisfactory? Um, and then any um, motion to accept the, the um, oh, uh, sorry, which one's uh, the, the um, September 23rd minutes? I'll move to um, approve the minutes. All right. Do we hear a second? I'll second. Uh, Janet can. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll go. We'll go with Martha on that one. Okay. <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> okay. So, um, if you could unmute and give me a voice vote, Jemsek. Uh, approve. Brooks. Yes. Breger. Yes. Hanner. Yes. McGowan. Yes. Tagliarulo. Yes. Minutes are approved from the 23rd of September. Mm -hmm. and, and Stephanie, thank you for your work on both of those sets of minutes were rather long and complex. And I guess you had to spend quite a lot of time getting it all together. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, great. Um, before we move to staff updates, I just wanted to uh, let folks know um about if you don't know already about two um applicable uh public opportunities hearings and and uh, uh information coming along these topics from our state government um many of you probably get are on these uh emails but just want to make sure as well as anybody in the public um so eea um energy environmental affairs uh secretariat uh, is having public hearings on their 20, 2050 Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Um, the first one was last evening, uh, which I listened to, very informative and helpful. Um, this, the, there's one going on actually, I think, right now, uh, but then there is an opportunity, uh, then all three of these public hearings are the same. It's a presentation and then an opportunity for public comment. Uh, there's the last last of the three identical sessions is October 11th. Um, you can find out more information from EEA on that or, or ask me, I can send you the email. Uh, and then also importantly um, and applicable to what we're doing is uh, DOER, uh, Department, of en uh, Department of Energy Resources is holding public workshops on their technical potential for solar study for this uh, for uh, potential but technical potential for solar study um, uh, where we'll no doubt learn more information about um, what that technical consultant is doing. Um, they did do a survey uh, on public perceptions uh, and maybe there'll be some information about that. Uh, I don't know whether this includes um, opportunities for public engage public comment and engagement, but I think it may. Um, and so they're holding again two, two sessions, uh, I think uh, identical to each other. Uh, uh, well, October 5th, uh, which already happened. Um, I did not attend that. If anybody did, I'd be interested in hearing. Uh, but then the, um, the second one and the last one is October 11th, um, six o'clock in the evening. Um, so if people are interested in that, um, you can find that out at DOER, or um, I can email you that. Hey, Duane, can you tell me the time for the EEA um, workshop on the 11th? Um, anybody know offhand? I, I failed to write that part down. Okay. Um, it's fine. We can leave it. As is. Laura, I can fill that in. Sure. Thanks. That's fine. Great. Okay. Um, with that, let's move on to staff updates. Um, and we'll start with uh, with Stephanie. Um, we will have a chance to talk about the um, 
uh, the, the um, solar study for, for Amherst a bit later. So we don't need to go into any detail on that at this point. Sure, I won't go into any big detail, but I will just say that we have entered into a contract with um, GZA Geo, Geo Environmental, and I will um, I can discuss that a little more further down um, when it comes up as an item agenda item. Great. And I don't uh, there's other things going on, but I just sort of feel like what's relevant to this group that's probably the most important piece. Absolutely, yep. Thank you. All right, and uh, Chris, thanks. Uh, good, uh, welcome, <laughs> um, and uh, good, good for you to be here. Thanks. Um, any staff updates on the planning department side? Um, do know I do have a, a, an agenda item later on that I want to sort of discuss in a little bit more uh, detail and get sort of a better understanding about uh, how the planning department is going to interact with us. Uh, with regard to actually starting to outline draft the, the bylaw, but uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but any other updates um, that would be helpful for us? Just two things. One is that the Shootsbury Planning Board is going to hold a virtual public hearing on Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be discussing um, two amendments to this Shootsbury zoning bylaw, mm -hmm. both of which appear to have a lot to do with solar. Um, I don't have a link, and I went on their website yesterday, I think, to uh, look for a link, and they haven't posted it yet, but they did send out this public notice, so I thought you might be interested. Monday, October 17th at 7, the Shootsbury Planning Board, and, th and that may, you know, have discussions that will be helpful to us. Um, and then the second thing is that Janet and I had a conversation or email exchange about um, drafting the text of the zoning amendment and she's got some things that she's written and she's going to send them to me and I've been taking notes on my own and so I'll be starting um, you know seriously about writing the text of the zoning bylaw amendment um, acknowledging the fact that we won't have the site assessment done um, when we're starting this but we'll you know be discussing it and both things will inform each other as we go along. So I'm looking forward to getting Janet's material and I'm going to be starting into um, this drafting next week. Super. And just for clarification there, that is the, the solar bylaw that we're, we're uh, that we, we as a working group are pulling together. Uh, yes, that's right. As, as, as a working group, right? Okay. Uh, when you say amendment, is that you say it's amendment because it's amending the the broader by, bylaws of the of the town? That's how we refer to it. Yeah, yeah it's okay. a zoning amendment in the sense that it will be a section that's added to the zoning bylaw. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, um, that relates to a topic later off later on that I have in terms of just getting getting going on. Uh, you know, I, I feel like a college student. It's actually like time to start writing the paper. So, yep. um, uh, um, so yeah, I'd be very interested in hearing a bit more um, from from you, Chris and Janet, on that uh, a little bit later in our agenda. Great. All right. Um, before we move on to the next and, and more substantial agenda item, um, just open the opportunity for any of the um, mem members of the working group that are, you know, sort of more official liaisons from their committees or um, um, commissions, um, anything to update um, from, from those committees or commissions um, that are useful for us to hear. Um, I don't think the planning board has anything on its docket about this, except the Zoning Board of Appeals is looking at an um, application for battery storage facility on 116. Mm -hmm. And that seems super interest, interesting to me. Um, yeah, we're looking at the two on the conservation committee. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So I don't think it's really large, but it's it's that lot where um, Annie's greenhouse used to be. And I know I have no details on it other than I've just seen reference to it. Mm -hmm. It's um it's actually a decent sized storage facility, but it doesn't take up a big footprint. So I can't um what I'm realizing here, I think what Jack noted before, it's difficult to take notes and talk at the same time. Yes. <laughs> so so I, 
uh, be more quiet, but yes, we're looking at the same thing too. I think it was continued. Um, so I'll have probably a more fulsome update. Obviously the CONCOM just looks at it up from the perspective of, you know, protecting water, water resources and during construction runoff and things like that. But, um, but uh, yeah, and I can, I, I actually have been involved in um, the siting of a battery storage facility, not as like an owner, but just kind of, you know, um, hearing more of the issues that um, some local developers are facing for these. These are more like DG, distributed generation battery storage, they're smaller. And some of the things that they're facing in terms of challenges. And I did speak with um, Mike Judge, who has been, at, who was at DOR for, set, I think for 17 years. He's now moved on to another group and I was just sort of chatting with him about something else and the topic of batteries came up and he was saying that storage is, um, that no one has really written bylaws on storage because it's just so new and they're learning so much more. So anyways, getting back to notes now. Great. Um, and I, you know, Christine could maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think the ZBA is just operating under that one sentence about energy facilities in the zoning bylaw. You know, you have to get a special permit if you're building something like that. And there's no standards, there's no conditions for battery storage. And so um, I guess that reinforces why we're here. And um, anyway, so I just thought that was, you know, they're basically operating off of a sentence in the bylaw without standards or performance standards or setbacks or, you know, other than the normal setbacks and things that would apply yeah. in that think, zone district. Um, yeah, I think one thing that would be interesting is, because um, I think, you know, these facilities and um, I actually think it'd be great if the group could tour. I know a lot of uh, solar storage facilities that I could get us into in the state and actually a really cool one. Um, um, in uh, actually a number of them, um, I'll just do close proximity, but um, there's a, one of the largest landowners in Eastern Mass is, um, they're also the, uh, the biggest cranberry grower. They give everything to Ocean Spring. They've done a series of solar arrays with battery storage. Um, and for the most part, these facilities are simple. You know, they're like little boxes, but they're obviously critical to the grid because it allows us to produce renewables and then store it and then deploy it when it's you know, when, when it's needed and, you know, um, you get more bang for your buck that way. But some of the issues that are facing um, battery storage facilities would be like um, heating, ventilating, and cooling. That's critical. Making sure temperature, you know, like those types of things. Um, and, you know, you also know, um, and I'll get into this when I talk about sort of the development process, but there's multiple sign-offs, just like there is for solar. You know, you have the developer who's doing it <clears throat> and, you know, they're signing off. Then you get these um, basically tests from independent third parties that go out and they submit their results to not only the ultimate owner of the project, the battery storage facility, but they also submit the results to the utility. So you have National Grid and Eversource reviewing these things. Um, and then, um, and then you finally get approval. So there's there already are multiple checks in place as far as like health and safety are concerned. Um, but like I hear you, Jenna, on like you know what's a setback? Do we you know is it different than solar? All that. So, anyways. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, I guess it's a um, <clears throat> uh, well that that project in North Amherst is sort of um, ahead of us. Uh, it seems like it's something that we can. Um, track and, and uh, help to inform us uh, as we uh, as we move forward with 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 the bylaws. Because my my guess is that project's going to be going through uh, the special process, I guess, um, prior to to the to, to any um, of our bylaws being being uh, um, codified. All right, great. Um, okay, anything else, sir? Great. Okay. Um, then let me um, move on to our um, next agenda topic, which is uh, really 
um, the opportunity for us as a working group to respond to um, and, and ask any questions uh, on to the um, um, Water Supply Protection Committee. Uh, and let me start this by really thanking Jack and his um, committee uh, for preparing this uh, white paper. Um, I thought it was very, uh, very helpful, informative, um, fairly well detailed, uh, set up sort of the um, environment of, of regulations and, and impact issues um, associated with solar um, uh, in, in our watershed uh, areas uh, and the con concerns um, and, and some uncertainties about, uh, about, um, about solar in, in, in these areas. Uh, so I thought it was really helpful document and white paper for us to uh, to have as a working group uh, as we start deliberating on the uh, zoning bylaws and particularly how that uh, when, when we get into sort of uh, particular issues with regard to solar and battery in um, in the wet, um, water protection areas. Uh, so really, thank you, Jack, on that. Um, my thought is that we really don't need a summary of the white paper because I think we all had the, the opportunity to, to read it. Um, I did receive um, a, a number of um, res resp re response to our request for any questions, uh, which then um, I compiled with S Stephanie's input as well into a, a, a do an aggregated document that we can look at shortly. Um, uh, but importantly, we want to um, finalize this set of questions that we want to ask the committee to consider uh, in there. Uh, uh, and we need to finalize that today uh, because the committee is, re is um, required or, or intends to finalize their report before we meet, meet next. Uh, and so uh, I want to um, go through that and um, see if there's uh, any, uh, if we can reach a consensus to move this forward as a, as a uh, consensus document, set of questions to, um, to the um, S W S P C. <laughs> um, um, but before I do that, let me, if Jack, if you don't mind, maybe I can just give you the floor for a second, not again, not for a summary of the document, but maybe just to, um, uh, just describe a little bit in terms of what the um, intent of the white paper was for our committee, for our working group, uh, as well as um, uh, a bit more in terms of your next steps, where this document sort of goes from here and next steps, um, uh, and then and then we can um, look at look at our set of questions. Yeah, so we met. Um, oh, geez. I don't know if it was a week or two weeks ago, but uh, it's hard to keep track. Yeah, right. So, but anyway, so uh, uh, you know, this was you know you know vetted within the the subcommittee within the water supply uh, protection committee uh, uh, based on the on the solar and water resources impact issues, and so we were just really you know uh, attentive to you know providing as many references uh, as possible on the different. Uh, topics that we identified as being the high points and the high points were, you know, the construction monitoring and kind of stormwater impacts that result from these uh, projects. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, groundwater quality and then groundwater quantity. So those are the, the main things. And then, you know, we, we have a couple of different, you know, types of uh, drinking water supplies within Amherst. We have the, you know, we have our, uh, uh, Atkins Reservoir, you know, which is our surface water supply. And then we have, um, you know, several municipal municipal wells. Um, so those are those stand out big. And then, but we then I think we have a very small segment of private wells within town. So we wanted to speak to that as well. Yeah. And so you know we're pulling from all sorts of, you know, best available tech, uh, you know, you know information that we have from pre existing. Uh, you know, regulations and guidelines to guide us in terms of what would be appropriate in terms of, you know, number one, setbacks, I guess, and and then just, you know, best management, management practices with regard to how we can 
uh, protect our water resources in the event of a, a solar development. And we also address the battery issues. And again, that you know, we and we, uh, <laughs> I think everybody knows that this is a moving, evolving topic. Um, you know, next week there may be another you know paper uh, on battery storage that 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 may or may not tell us something. But it's just you know, it, it's it's something that is kind of uh, interesting that there's not a single you know bylaw within that's been written. Uh, within the state or or any state that I that I'm that we're aware of, but so this is you know just trying to to do a very practical approach about you know what we know. There there have been some horrific sort of accidents with batteries, and I think that kind of taints uh, the approach moving forward. But that that happened you know years ago, and we're much smarter now. And I think there's a lot of you know sensor and uh, prevention measures within each of the battery units. And it's not like we're gonna be dousing water to put out a fire in the event that it would happen. I think the, the progress of sh the shutdown mechanisms is much more advanced. And you know, we acknowledge that you know, our, our emer emergency response personnel need special training for this, you know, if, they don't, if, not, if they're not familiar with it. And, um, but anyway, we, we you know we, we probably went a little bit beyond the, the straight kind of water resources impact, mm -hmm. um, and I guess we you know we'd be interested you know in the questions that you provided, but if you want us to go a little bit further and in, in other uh, you know aspects of this, we 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 certainly can. But we we tried to you know stick with the water resources impact, but um, and we even offered some suggestions to setbacks uh, based on the mass DEP guidelines for municipal water supplies, which are, you know, several orders of magnitude with regard to the what a private well would 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 require. And so we're, you know, there's a scaling issue there. Uh, but we we you know provided I think some reasonable suggestions on that. Great. Thank you. And just in terms of uh, timing, just to confirm, you're looking for um, the committee would be looking for our, our questions and appreciate bringing it forward to the working group questions. And then, um, you know, again, we I think we have to be careful. We don't want to overburden you with way too many questions and and uh, research that would need to be done that is beyond the scope of the uh, time of the committee members. Uh, but um, you're basically looking to finalize this, work, get, receive our feedback, and then um, uh, provide a final report, uh, sort of in what time frame? Yes, I think we put it out to to you know the town staff, Chris, you know Stephanie. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the wetland agent. <laughs> Sorry, um, but you know we're, we're we never we uh, we didn't get uh, feedback from the town. Uh, uh, experts within town hall. So, so we're going to get your comments and we're going to get comments from Stephanie and Chris, yeah. um, uh, the wetland agent. I, again, I can't remember her name, but um, apologize for that. And then we'll finalize it. And then I guess it kind of comes back to this group mm -hmm. <laughs> and then gets, you know, processed. So, um, you know, I guess it's it's pretty going to be fairly inefficient because uh, you have seen it. I was thinking that maybe we we would have every you know the, Chris's and, and Stephanie's comments before we presented it to you, but uh, this is probably going to move it a little bit faster. So okay, great. <clears throat> um, and so just to be clear, um, this is really written with uh, obviously for the for the town generally but with with our working group in mind as a re, as a resource uh for our working group uh to have at our disposal as particularly as we deliberate and craft the uh, bylaws uh with regard to um uh solar development particularly in our water protection zones or areas um, yeah I, I think it i think i think it's fairly unique in its you know what 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 we did i don't know there's anything quite like this in terms of, you know, framing a solar development and how it may or may not impact, uh, you know, the the you know mainly water resources. But great. Uh, so hopefully, 
you know, it's, it's uh, people uh, can use it and it, it will improve our judgment and decisions, you know, moving forward. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, Stephanie? Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Jack, just for people to know the wetlands administrator is Erin Jacques. So just to give her a call out there. Um, so I think we have until the 20th to get the responses. I think your next meeting is on the 20th. So we were asked to get all feedback by then. And I didn't know what the next steps were. So um, wasn't clear that it was coming back to us or not. Um, just that it was only coming back as a final document. That was just what I had heard. So I don't know if that's true. Um, uh, and then yeah, I, I think that was our intent. Yeah, you know, and then, I mean, we 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 can't. Uh, I I'm just a little bit. Um, uh, just want to have you know a little note of caution there that you know things are always changing, especially with the battery thing. So we're not going to be able to get you know the article that was posted you know yesterday, you know, in there, and it's just in. And I think we get the gist of what the issues are on these things. And so it's, I think we would, you know, lurking for the, you know, solo bylaw uh, working group there just to, if you, if there's something that we've missed, then, then that's really important that, and, and then maybe we can grab that um, and add that into that. And then, you know, uh, but the conclusions are pretty solid, you know, so I just, but we want to make sure that since we're into it, you know, knee deep, that if there's something additional that you that the that this uh working group wants us to to speak to, then uh we will see if we can do it. Dwayne, would it be helpful for me to share my screen with the questions so that people you could go actually go through them? That, that would that be great. Be that was gonna be my next step. And I was okay. about to do that, but it makes sense for you to do it, Stephanie. Sure. Yeah. You can just tell me to scroll down when you need me to. Yeah. Great. Okay. And um, yeah, just so people know the, the process here, um, I provided some questions um, and then I received some from uh, uh, Martha and from Janet. Um, I did take some. Um, uh, discretion at, at um, editing or, or recomposing a little bit the questions uh, that I received that I didn't write myself uh, to try to put them one in a little bit more question form, uh, which was sort of our charge uh, to, 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 to provide to the, uh, the um, water committee. Um, and also to scrub out some of the, some of the comment, some of the commentary that I thought was was useful but not uh, necessarily um, within the purview of the of, of um, Jack and his committee's work but we can sort of revisit that as we go as we go through these um, and so um, um, I guess I can um, take a lead on these first set of questions as these were the ones that I had sort of put together um, if that would be and the idea here is that, um, you know, I, I don't think we need to um, edit in real time the, the, the questions themselves, but just to, in terms of the gist of the questions, uh, we can be open to any additional questions that people come up with, uh, but I don't want to um, uh, have a floodgate of that because we, we have limited time and we need to finish this up today, uh, and we have other agenda items. Um, okay, uh, Janet, before we get going, yeah. Sorry, I, I had some questions for page three, but lead on. I'm jumping in too early. I okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so the, the first set of questions uh, that, that I had sort of put together was, you know, as I was reading through it, some, some questions came to my mind and areas that would be helpful. There was reference to, um, you know, the, the CMR 22.2. Uh, which seemed uh, quite important in terms of the the um, uh, some key provisions. Um, I thought it'd be helpful if possible if the committee could sort of just summarize uh, what those key provisions were in those regulations and whether uh, it wasn't clear whether those um, were specific to solar or battery, I, I just, uh, certainly solar, or whether they were just more um, 
with regard to watershed protection. Uh, but any more uh, detail or or discussion on that uh, would be helpful. Uh, and I'm not, Jack, I'm not necessarily looking for, an I don't think we're looking for answers yet, but certainly if, if you need clarification of any of these questions uh, would would be, be uh, good to hear that. Yeah, I can give like a, you know, 30 second response if you'd like, or I can just, we can just go through the, the questions. And, let's, and let's do that because uh, then I think ultimately, I think it would be helpful maybe just if the final report came by, came in with a, just a couple extra sentences okay. uh, on these issues. So it's documented uh, beyond this recording. Um, okay. And Janet, do you still have your hand up or is that new? Oh, it's, it's, sorry. It's my, oh, sorry, it's my old question. It's your old hand, okay. Um, okay. Um, um, yeah, then, then I had a, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I don't think I have to talk about each question. I, I did want, the, the, the third question I had there, you did talk about, and the report talked about um, specific um, monitoring, um, and talked about both during construction and then post-construction. It never really defined the period that was considered to be post-construction. Uh, and I, you know, my sense is there's maybe, I don't know, maybe three phases construction and then, you know, a period of time, which may be a year or two where there's kind of reestablishment of the, of the um, uh, vegetative growth and so forth. And then there's just sort of operation for many, many years after that. And um, it didn't really dif differentiate on that in terms of monitoring and so forth. And it, it, I, I wasn't clear whether the recommendation from the committee was that these regular um, inspections and so forth, which were, which were pretty, you know, frequent uh, certainly during construction, uh, but even after, even in the post-construction time frame, was that meant to carry on for the twenty years of the of the project or sort of through this establishment phase? Um, uh, so just some thoughts on that. I, I would understand sort of if there's a major rain event, uh, maybe there's some uh, inspection of this of the sites even after they're after they've been around for many, many years. But uh, but otherwise, it didn't. I, I wasn't clear whether uh, the intent was to inspect these things regularly once they're really well established. So maybe just some thoughts on that. Um, uh, sorry, Stephanie, if you can scroll down then. To the yeah to the next page yeah okay so um, yeah you talked about um, uh, sort of a talked about obviously PFAS is uh, a major uh, concern and issue particularly anything that would get into the water supply um, but also you, you the the report talked earlier about how at least for the solar panels these things are really well encapsulated into the into the uh, panels themselves very well protected uh, but then there was sort of this um recommendation that was sort of like a bit out of the not out of the blue but a little bit unexpected i guess that oh let's just you know uh it seemed like with all caution let's just say no solar collectors that have any pfas in them could be in, could be located in these watershed areas and i guess my question was um i don't know about the chemist all the chemistry in in the solar collectors but my I wouldn't be surprised if there's some PFAS and because their PFAS is used for so many different things um, that could could indeed be encapsulated in some of the um, substructures of the of the solar panels um, uh, encapsulated and so forth. Uh, and so I I just before we would sort of consider just a ban on any solar collectors with PFAS, I'd be just curious if there's any knowledge. Um, about whether there's any commercial solar solar panels that don't have PFAS. Yeah, um, I can look, I can certainly look into that. Um, okay. And um, I think right now, just to give everyone a context as to where we are with panel 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 manufacturing as a nation, we have this massive um, um, inflation reduction act that just passed at the federal level providing huge amounts of dollars <clears throat> for renewables. And one of the main ways that they're incenting this renewable development, particularly solar, is to ensure that the panels are manufactured domestically. 
So right now, solar manufacturers, installers, and owners are pushing for panels that have been made in the United States. So I think there's two questions here. One, are PFAS, you know, can you, you know, is it, are you allowed to manufacture panels onshore that include that? And two, I think your question is valid, you know, how, you know, are there any commercial panels that, that don't include these? And Jack, you might know this. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand, guys. I'm sorry. I'm like taking notes and pivoting. Um, <laughs> are, are there any, I'll, I'll remember this. Thank you. Are there any panels that, um, you know, what's the, how difficult would it be to source panels without those? Yeah, I think, and again, we're not sort of looking for answers right now, but just any, uh, any, and maybe it's something we have to research further, uh, but go ahead, Jack. Uh, I just want to say it's kind of, because in our review, we really didn't find contaminant um, sources, uh, you know, within the solar panel development themselves, but we did find references that, you know, PFAS could be there, but it's not documented. So just out of abundance of caution, we put it in there because we certainly don't want, you know, PFAS leaching into the environment from a, a new installation, so. Yeah, um, go ahead, Martha. It, it seems that maybe the more interesting aspect of the question is whether there are any coatings or adhesives or something that was not part of the solar panel manufacturer, but was put on as a coating for some reason that might have included some chemicals that we didn't want. So maybe that's the more interesting thing to investigate. In terms of PFAS uh, potentially yeah. being yes. exterior to yes. the encapsulated part of the, yes. of the collector. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Um, Janet, I presume that's a new hand, right? <laughs> yes, it's, I finally am more organized. Um, in the PFAS front, I was wondering um, about adding that to the battery storage facility. And also, if there is a fire, you know, a require, did they think about a requirement that um, the firefighters don't use anything involving PFAS in terms of, you know, what they're spraying on there? Yeah, I think there was some uh, Does that come, discussion does that come about later? that. Yeah. Yeah, I think we referenced that, Janet, but yeah. we okay. can double check. Yeah, I, I recall reading that that made sense. I mean, that's where PFAS, I think, started <laughs> um, in the firefighting foam um, and would not make sense to spray that. Um, and I think there was, re I, I do recall reference somewhere in the, in okay. the white paper. All right, great. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Then um, it just, I was, I was reading that um, uh, for the battery storage uh, housing must be, should be located above the hundred year floodplain. Um, uh, just if, if it's reasonably easily known, I presume probably Chris would know this or could find out the information. I was just trying to get some sense of how relevant that was to our you know, primary watersheds, the the um, the Atkins, the the uh, Lawrence Swamp, um, and the third one, which I'm blocking on, um, as well as the private wells in sort of north north uh, what was northeast Amherst. Um, whether are 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 those are those uh, um, well above the hundred year floodplain at this point, or maybe or maybe not? So, uh, just wondering how applicable that was um, in terms of a concern we need to really address. It doesn't hurt to put it in the bylaw, but I'm just wondering um, uh, how um, relevant it is. But Chris? I just wanted to say that if anything is proposed in the 100-year floodplain, the Conservation Commission would get wind of it. Um, generally mm -hmm. speaking, we don't allow things to be right. built or, or placed mm -hmm. in the 100-year floodplain. Um, if they are, then there are certain requirements, but I doubt that the Conservation Commission would allow anything to be placed in the 100 year floodplain, especially battery storage. Um, you know, things like um, bridge abutments and that kind of thing that have to be in the floodplain can be there. But otherwise, you know, I would say it's rem very remotely possible that anything related to battery storage could be placed in the floodplain. But maybe it's a question that we need yeah. to have definitively yeah. no, you're right. answered. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. And would would uh, Chris? So would you? Not that you need to 
um, dig it out right now, but are there maps I presume that we could look at that would define the 100 year floodplain zones? Yes, we, we have two levels of maps right now. We have the old maps that were done in the 1980s, and we're working on getting new maps approved, and we're very close to being able to do mm -hmm. that. In fact, we have a deadline of February 9th of 2023 to get our new maps approved, and we do have them available if people want to look at mm -hmm. them. But yes, we do have maps that show where the 100-year floodplain is, and those maps are relied upon by the Conservation Commission in their... Um, evaluation of whether something's being proposed in the floodplain or not. Okay, good. I mean, to me, it sounds like that that layer, assuming it's sort of a GIS layer, would be helpful even for us to put onto the um, solar um, assessment mapping, uh, even though it, it's more to do with batteries. It would just give us a, a, a clear demarcation of where um, those that flood zone is, uh, maybe even if it's not adopted yet. <laughs> um, uh, maybe we can say it's tentative, um, uh, so that we could we could uh, you know have a visual on that as well. I think Mike Warner is working on that. Mike Warner in okay, yeah, IT, yep. All right, great. Um, yep, uh, Laura. No, I was going to say that um, two things. The Conservation Commission always looks at the hundred-year floodplain um, before we are you know. Um, as we're as part of any project, and Aaron in particular, you know, surfaces it to the conservation committee um, before we are evaluating any project within a, a wetland area or water protection area. And the second thing is um, the last thing any developer or asset owner wants is to have a major investment within um, within that hundred year floodplain, especially in the climate environment that we're at right now. Yeah. And we would, um, I mean, if just because it popped in my head, I mean, obviously battery storage, uh, I can definitely see that not wanting to be in the flood zone, in the hundred year flood zone. Mm -hmm. Would that be similarly yeah, um, so, relevant so, to the so, solar, solar, solar development itself, solar installation? Yeah. So um, for the most part, hundred year floodplains are avoided with all solar development. That okay. being said, I have seen some that have been constructed with the proper precautions. So you, they have to be higher, you know, you're anticipating that that flooding event would occur. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's new technology coming about with solar constantly, like floating panels, things like that. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, great. Um, Jack. Yeah, so th this uh, was taken verbatim from the Mass DEP guidance for public water supplies. And they, you know, they spoke to batteries because the leaching uh you know threat exists you know more so than the solar and then i think you know the solar that they were addressing was more uh say in support of the local uh you know the pumping and uh, other ancillary equipment for 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 a, a municipal well and so you know i don't think they were really looking at large but they, you know at least they they knew that you know battery was a little bit different than the solar panels but I think you know everything that everybody said. You know, makes you know a lot of sense here. So, perfect. <clears throat> All right, great. Um, and then um, I, I just in in reading the white paper, you did reference this one article, journal article, which I actually I did search for. I, even as an academic, I couldn't. I, I found the article, but uh, it didn't give me the full article. Um, so I was. You know, I was, and, and it was it was an important um, remark, I guess, in the white paper with regard to, um, you know, potentially that uh, uh, there could be mo modeled effects uh, of um, uh, detectable uh, increases in in uh, river discharge uh, from increasing solar uh, on land cover, um, and. Um, and, and so, you know, intellectually, I can understand that, but I, I, I did raise the question, and maybe if it's if it's relatively easy to find that article and and, and provide any more information um, of of um, whether that either modeled, it seemed like it was a modeled impact, but um, do keep in mind is that is sort of my question raises is that um, depending on the context of this modeling and and uh, analysis that was done, you know, whether it was um, really a, an impact that is uh, detectable from very, very large solar arrays uh, that are quite prevalent in other parts of the country 
uh, versus um, you know still large but still relatively small uh, arrays that we tend to build in Massachusetts. Um, and whether if there was could be if there was any information from that paper, just to um, uh, either caveat or 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 um, uh, discuss a little bit more in terms of what scale of of arrays they were modeling there. Oh, and then also the slope. I, I, I'm not sure if this was on uh, considered um, on flat land or or um, or with some slope. Um, okay. Uh, okay, a couple more hands. Yep. Okay, uh, Chris. So I just wanted to note that in Massachusetts, um, developers are required to keep drainage on site. Um, they're required to um, not increase the volume or the rate the rate of runoff of from a site so they have to you know provide catchment areas where water can be contained for a period of time and then allow it to exit the site at the rate that it's currently exiting the site so i don't imagine that um this type of effect would be true in massachusetts that you would have an increase in river discharge as a result of solar because the solar you know, we'll provide these basins to contain the runoff um, from at least the hundred year storm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and so that, that's, that's not just during construction, Chris, but for the duration of the- it's of for the, the duration. Site. Yes. Yeah, it's exactly. a requirement of okay. DEP, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I guess, I guess my understanding from the, from Jack's or the committee's white paper and that journal article, this was more, this also was the, and I guess you're getting at this, Chris, but um, it wasn't that there was more, there to the extent that the solar array replaced a forest, say, there was more, um, more water that had to run off uh, because less water was being uh, transpired by the yeah. trees and so forth. And it's not, it's not, it's not a de minimis amount. <laughs> That the trees uptake and uh, and, and and so forth. So um, the 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 it seems like the total volume of water may um, increase, but you're saying that with these catch basements and storage and so forth, that the rate of that discharge would be maintained uh, as as uh, as a business as usual, or at least in in the previous um, uh, use of the land. Okay. That's correct. Yep. All right. Interesting. Okay, so that that would imply that um, uh, the solar developers or or their consultants would would have to do would do hydrology tests on these uh, soils and so forth before um, the development starts. Okay, all right, great, um, Janet. Um, I would add a piggyback question, which I wondered when I read the article. You know, because the um, you know water that goes you know, that's being absorbed in a forest or a well-developed field or shrubs, there's a lot of filtration. And so my question was, is there any difference in the quality of the water um, being discharged into the river? So um, it's one thing to hold water in a catch basin and then slowly release it. But the, my understanding from seeing a lecture is that the water that goes through the forest system and the roots and the fungi and the whole community is very clean. And there's like uptake of minerals and, you know, even chemicals and the water that comes out is cleaner and, and more pure than if you just hold it in a catch basin and slowly release it. So my question is, is there a difference in water quality? Like the piggyback question is, is there a difference in the water quality of what's going into the river or the drinking water system collection? Perfect. And, and, and I did note your question, that specific question is is uh, is coming up, but it's relevant to this. Sorry, I didn't read this ahead of time. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. And I guess, you know, that in my mind, at least that um, would also, you know, relate to whether this is, you know, uh, one relatively small patch in a huge expanse of forest, mm -hmm. um, or is it, um, you know, cutting down a, a primary track of forest that is between, is where water is flowing through. Um, okay, great. So, um, all right, any other questions? That, that's um, the primary questions I had come up with in, in the review and, and uh, uh, we can move on to, uh, I, I think these uh, came from you, Janet, um, uh, with a little bit of um, 
editing uh, from me just to put them sort of in more clear question forms. Um, and um, I guess I was also curious, um, and, and Janet, you can um, tell me if I'm not capturing, if I didn't capture your questions correctly, but uh, the first one was just, I, I, actually, I was kind of curious too, that Atkins Reservoir particularly um, uh, is um, only a small, <laughs> small amount of the Atkins watershed area uh, protection area is in Amherst. The rest is in um, Shutesbury, I believe. Um, and so um, I, I presume our bylaw wouldn't um, pertain to the Shutesbury side, but I guess there was a question of, of whether um, um, whether that that map Jack does really capture, you know, based the way the water flows and so forth, does capture really the the catchment basement basin for um, the Atkins Reservoir, just a relatively small amount in Amherst. Um, yeah, I mean, we're going to have, you know, we let me see. I I know we provided the maps there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and they're they're in, at the end of the. Yes. Yeah. So so the purple line there on uh, yeah. figure four or three figure three, uh, is what is estimated as you know being the watershed. Yeah. Uh, so that you know that's fairly well known. It's based on topography. Um. And again, we have these other protected. You know, we have the zone A. Yeah. Uh, which is just a setback from from. You know the drainage, uh, perennial drainage, going into the Atkins Reservoir. So, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, given Figure Three, showing where the watershed boundary is. Um, yeah, was that just the basis of your question, Jan? And just um, assuring your your uh, uh, actually understanding so this document that it's really just a little bit in Amherst that's in this water protected watershed area? You know, I, I, I'm not sure this question is, I, I, it looks different from what I sent you. So my question basically was how much land are we, is, you know, in Amherst heading, you know, is, so how much land are we talking about that in, in the Atkins um, reservoir system? Like I just, it was this whole idea of scope. Like, I just think, you know, there's a huge watershed and then there's a sort of smaller protection zone by the state and regulations. And it just struck to me that there was, I was just wondering how many acres of land are in that little piece that in the watershed for, for Amherst. Um, and then I just, you know, I, that, the question to me then is like, okay, what are we talking about? And then, you know, how many, I know the state is sort of saying, you know, a hundred feet, 200 feet or whatever, but isn't all that water from that system or that part going into the reservoir? And so the state, all those waters infiltrating coming from the watershed and the state is only protecting a number from the reservoir itself. And so I just kind of wondered how big is that, you know, watershed piece in Amherst and then we're only protecting part of it or the state regulations only protect part of that, but a lot of, you know, water can be coming in from further back. Is that, I don't, that's yeah. You know what I mean? Like you sort just, of take, go ahead. I'm just, I just eyeballing it. You know, it looks like a, you know, a couple hundred acres. Um, um, you know, it not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's not going to be a, a huge driver. I don't think uh, with our, because it affects such a small area, but we, you know, we definitely want to protect that. Um, and then in terms of the, um, you know, my part of town, you know, it just, it also just struck me like with the um, Lawrence Swamp, it seems unbuildable of any solar array in most of the watershed area, but I didn't know if I was correct because I just didn't know where we were because the maps didn't have roads and things like that. So that that's, you know, maybe that would be more, I don't know if the white paper should include that, like, you know, where the watershed is, where the roads are, and then where the protection areas are, which are much smaller. But I did have this question of like, can you build anything in the water, the Lawrence Swamp area? Because it just seems really wet from what I- that, Yeah, that, and that was a little later question, I think, was that uh, in the Lawrence Swamp region, it does, I mean, just from my knowledge of it along the bike path and elsewhere, there's obviously places that is literally a swamp. Um, and and I, I can't imagine 
<laughs> that solar development would go there. Uh, but looking at the map, it's a much broader extent uh, mm -hmm. of area that um, I, I presume also goes beyond just the wet, the area that is you know perennially wet. Um, and um, I guess just a little bit more clarification of of um, uh, of the extent of this Lawrence swamp area, swamp area, uh, in terms of um, what's being what's what's being protected, and and um, um, in terms of both areas that are wet as well as areas that are outside that areas that are permanently wet, essentially or or mostly always wet, um, but are still part of this watershed. Um, uh, Chris, you may have some. <laughs> so I wanted to say a couple of things, a few things. There's a watershed protection zoning district that's established around the Amherst portion of the Atkins Reservoir. And you can see why that is there if you look at the topography map that's on our Amherst GIS. And you have to kind of zoom out so you get the actual um, contour lines. But you can see clearly that there's a high point um, kind of surrounding Atkins Reservoir, and then everything that hits onto the high point, the east um, slope of it goes into the Atkins Reservoir, but the west slope goes elsewhere. So it's clearly delineated in my mind why that Watershed Protection District is there. So I encourage you to look at the zoning map for the Watershed Protection District and also look at the topo map for that area around Atkins. And the other thing is that um, the Lawrence Swamp is mostly 100-year floodplain. And mm. whatever isn't 100-year floodplain is most probably bordering vegetated wetland. And there's very little area in between those things that would allow a large-scale solar array to be built there. Um, so, And there is also an aquifer recharge protection district over that whole area of the Lawrence Swamp. So there are multiple layers of um, protection of that area. So um, I, I don't think we need to worry about solar arrays being built in the Lawrence Swamp or very close to it. Right, and I think these will be things that I, I, my personal thought is we don't have to burden the uh, water committee uh, on this. This will be things that will come out in our solar solar assessment mapping, uh, where we see all these different areas, the watersheds and, and everything that will be well mapped together that we can start um, getting these visuals together and, and sort of understand uh, topographies and so forth and why they're they're defined this way. Um, Martha and then Jack. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I think I think that Chris answered most of my question. I was the one that asked about the uh, boundaries with the Atkins Reservoir and why uh, there was very little in Amherst. But Chris, I think your answer is is the topography uh, on that. Um, but then uh, on a related point about the filtration of the forests it was interesting. My my family's here, and we went over to Quabbin yesterday. And so we went into the uh, DCR's visitor center and looked at their exhibit on protecting uh, the quality of water in the Quabbin and so on. And they had quite a, a lot in their display about how they, after the last really serious drought, they um, had really worked on trying to restore the forests and so on uh, to uh, protect the quality of the water. And I thought it was interesting enough, I actually took a, a, fi a picture of one of their, um, um, their little write-ups. And I don't know, Stephanie, whether you would be willing to have me just share screen and, and show that uh, uh, temporarily or... Uh, That's see. up to Duane. Yeah, or maybe maybe not. I'll just, well, let's, let's not take the time now. But yes, uh, yeah, we, okay. We I'm just mentioning it that they were making a big point then about how they really were uh, emphasizing protecting the forests surrounding the Quabbin in order to um, really uh, improve the quality of of the water there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, my apologies, Martha. I think this uh, that's okay. We're yep, looking at sure. now are, 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 would emanate from you. Sure. Yep. That's okay. fine. Yep, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Dwayne, I agree. I think this is the first time we've been looking at maps. And so we're all kind of getting you yes. know, excited and jumping to conclusions. And, and I was like, well, you know, and there's always, you know, more information you can put on these. But, uh, but you know, it's not a, it shouldn't be a huge effort. But if it is, you know, 
we won't do it, but if, if it's not, we can definitely put the overlay of the floodplain things uh, and the, and the um, you know wetlands and buffer on there. But again, we're going to see that eventually anyway. Yeah. Um, but I did want to speak to the water quality uh, issue. So um, you know, there's forest, you know, and then what we have determined is that the solar field is equivalent to a grassland. So you know, I've not seen a lot of of uh, uh, complaints about grassland is in terms of being protective of water quality because uh, there's filtration going on, uh, you know, through through uh, that you know ecosystem as well, you know, as well as the forest. I mean, and actually, I can tell you that there's huge issues with the uh, the amount of uh, uh, forest uh, plantings that have occurred around a lot of the existing reservoirs within Massachusetts, particularly the red pines, uh, because of their demand on uh, on the groundwater and the you know the evapotranspiration uptake. So they actually the 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 state I know is like struggling with like getting rid of uh, you know all these pines they they planted you know adjacent to the reservoirs. So you know it's a mixed bag, but you know. Grassland versus forest, I think it's all good as long as not, we're putting, you know, we're not putting chemicals down on the ground. I think either one in the soil is always there as well, doing its thing in terms of that absorption. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, just standing back, grassland is, is also fairly protective of groundwater. I just want to say that. Great. Okay, um, great, Laura, and then we'll go on. Yep, I just want to say one thing. Um, it's totally reasonable from the, the perspective of the working group, and I've seen this many times in multiple states, to um, require that any developer actually, um, you can you can do things like require pollinator habitat. You can require plantings of certain vegetation that are actually helpful to going beyond and restoring water, water quality. So. As Jack mentioned, it's the equivalent to grassland. You could make it better than that. Um, there's all kinds of things that um, are very reasonable to ask developers to do, and that I see, you know, across the board. So, great. Yeah, we did actually um, ask our legal counsel to confirm that in terms of putting those sort of requirements in a bylaw, uh, but um, sounds like it's reasonable. Yeah. I don't know if it, I don't know if it has to be a requirement. It could be a strong suggestion, and everything's in negotiation. So, you yeah. know, that's that's what I've seen. Great. All right, good. Um, I guess um, Jack, I th Martha did bring up a, a question that's uh, worthy to maybe get a little bit more information from the committee on with regard to um, this no disturbance zone around private wells. Uh, now, obviously, as you said, these are orders of magnitudes less um, in, uh, less draw of water and, and supply to people. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think they're primarily for individual homes. Um, and uh, you sort of recommended a 100 foot, no disturbance zone around those. Um, I do recognize if somebody wants to put a PV array in their backyard, um, 100 foot, you know, these yards are not that huge, so uh, you might, anything too much larger might in, not enable them to put up a solar panel, um, uh, at least ground mounted, or, or maybe even um, um, on the roof. <laughs> um, but um, I guess maybe just, uh, just as you put that out there of 100 foot feet, uh, maybe just a, a little bit of a discussion of why that seemed to be appropriate. Um, Martha, it was that sort of captured the question. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it was more, you know, pic picturing uh, the, the drainage and the soil types and so on, whether the water always percolates straight down or whether if, if you have an impervious kind of a, a subsurface, it uh, drains more sideways. And, and again, it, you know, in my picture, it's more the disruption during the construction when you maybe have heavy equipment in, in there and you've disrupted the soil and so on in a, in a large uh, setting. So that was just a question. Yeah. All right, good. I'm um, Jack. Did, um, 
Yeah, just briefly, you know, that 100 foot distance is kind of hardwired, you know, for for years and years and years with regard to a home and what the protective radius you would want, say, to a septic system, uh -huh. uh, a fuel tank, all these uh -huh. known contaminant uh -huh. sources, whereas yeah. a solar field is does not have it is not a qualified as a contaminant source. So we thought that 100 foot buffer at a minimum is, is good battery. We we suggest we suggested you know larger, but then you know obviously the construction, you know that has to be protective, you know in terms of runoff and things like that. And that's um, we didn't speak to that. We'll we'll we we certainly will. Then, all right, good. Okay, thank all right, you. Uh, yep. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then we talked a little bit already about the uh, the soil uh, types and whether there should be any discrimination of these setbacks and so forth or or rules with regard that are differentiated by uh, soil types and um, uh, and I think you also had um, um, slopes as well somewhere here or soil types you know whether it's sandy soil or clay soil or bedrock uh, in terms of what the the implications of that with regard to the direction and uh, rate of flows. Um, Okay, um, I think we covered the um, issue with regard to forest cover for filtering um, stormwater. Um, I guess the, the um, there was discussion in the stormwater section. Um, about um, controlling runoff and monitoring runoff. Um, but I guess the question that Martha raised of whether that should also be differentiated in any way by slope. Um, so maybe something to, to uh, think about there. Um, all right. And I guess um, just on the battery storage, um, you know, I, I applaud you and the committee, Jack, uh, for an, a, a, an area that's so new and fast changing that you actually provided quite a bit of useful uh, information. Uh, but I guess as we start thinking about our technical um, consultant that we're going to be working with, um, uh, if there's any guidance that the committee can provide in terms of what the gaps are uh, uh, of information on 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 regulations uh, on on um, zoning or, or concerns with regard to battery storage that our technical consultant should be um, directed to help bring some of that information forward. That would be that would be helpful. Um, okay, um, and I think we're on uh, to Janet's um, questions that she provided, sort of in an email. But um, I, I think I extracted the questions re reasonably. Um, the first one I think we addressed all rather already, and I think uh, you know we'll get this all mapping done uh, in our own exercises. Uh, but um, oh, and I would say only if it's very easy <laughs> for the committee, uh, just to add a few more street names to help orient uh, the reader. Uh, I enjoyed trying to <laughs> navigate a little bit, but uh, it was it was kind of hard. Um, but again. We, you know, only if it's relatively straightforward. Um, uh, again, I think this this second question um, it, only if, if 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 easy. But you know, once we get this all mapped ourselves, uh, GIS will tell us these areas um, pretty pretty uh, readily. Um, and I think we addressed that other one. Um, so with that. Uh, let me let me uh, before turning to Janet, um, just for everybody else, um, let's uh, any thing, uh, any question, burning questions that you think we're missing that we want to raise and bring forward to the committee. Um, now's the chance. Uh, but then otherwise, uh, I want to uh, agree on sending this forward to Jack uh, and to the committee uh, as a um, response from this working group. Um, Janet, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. Sorry. I really appreciate the question, putting these questions together in the work of this committee, because really, they really dove into it. 
One question I had um, was, you know, they talked about the two on page three, the Williamsburg and Southampton things. And I don't know if you were just being like sensitive to nerves of these people who lived or the companies, but I didn't actually understand what went wrong. And so, um, you know, I figured you really had to work it up to get a million dollar farm fine from um, from DEP or whoever got sued. And so I just wondered if, if they could be a little more specific about like, did they not put their erosion controls in? Were the slopes too great? Like what happened that was wrong and what didn't they do? So we can sort of learn from that experience. And then that I wondered if it was just very slopey land and if the committee had thought about putting a recommendation in about percentage of slope. So. And I guess uh, just more along details. those same lines, I, I do wonder whether there was any, uh, apart from the, the water committee, uh, was there any, um, report filed uh, more formally uh, to uh, identify what, what went wrong and what, what some of the remedies might be in the future. Uh, Jack? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you, the, we knew that that was out there. And, you know, with, their, with regard to the Q&A part, you know, we definitely wanted to speak to it a little bit. But I, um, but I, I do know that it kind of Fell under the the realm of the um, of of the permitting and construction monitoring and things like that. That, that, that I know that Williamsburg was um, a gravel extraction site, and that was not accounted for at all during the process that that particular solar field was approved. So they go in, and they have no no protective cover, no 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 turf of any type of where they're putting the solar panels and it was just a recipe for disaster and i think you know amherst i think is fortunate to have the resources the town resources uh to kind of have some oversight there but you know one thing that i, I do want to say is like we were trying to push that more on the developer here with regard to being diligent with regard to you know weekly reports going out after you know uh you know substantial rainfall events that sort of thing and, and put the onus on the developer uh, in that respect, because we we certainly don't want that to happen, uh, those sorts of things to happen in, in Amherst. All right, good. Um, more details about what went wrong, you know, like more, you know, because you know it in your head, but I just, I was just dying to know like what happened. Yeah, we can do a few few bullets perhaps, and and kind of yeah, pull it out a little bit. Great. Okay, and I think um, uh, um, maybe we can take the, uh, I think that's a, uh, a good thing to add, Janet, to our set of questions, or, or maybe in, embedded in one of the other questions, or, or just put it out there as an additional question. Uh, and so let me suggest that with that addition um, to this set of questions, um, are we, um, are there any other questions that anybody else has that want to bring forward to Jack to report back to the committee in our document? Um, let me let me ask ask that question. Great. Um, so with with that, are um, uh, people uh, Approve, uh, uh, approving, and, and Stephanie, I could use your guidance of whether we need a, a motion here or whether we can just agree to agree uh, to um, take this document of, of uh, our set of questions uh, from the Solar Bylaw Working Group uh, as a response back to the um, Water Supply Protection Committee. Uh, in our review of their report and request uh, them to the extent that they are able to address our questions in their final report. I think I think you can just agree that they're complete. Yeah. The questions are complete. Yeah. Um, anybody have any uh, issues with um, no. agreeing that they are complete? No. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I think I will. Um, I do like Janet your 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 addition of just asking a little bit more details of if there could be some documentation bullets on what might be lessons learned from the um, yeah. from the two projects that went awry a bit. 
Um, but other than that, we'll forward this on. I'll, I'll add that and then get that to Stephanie and then she can um, forward that on to um, Jack and the committee. Super. All right. Great. And we, we're at 220-ish, uh, so we're good. Um, uh, and let's move on to the next um, agenda item, um, which is really an update from Stephanie uh, on the uh, solar assessment update. Uh, you, you mentioned before, I'm not sure if there's a whole lot more to say than that, but um, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, actually, so I have met with the consultants a few times um, since signing the contract. And so next steps are to, um, they're going to put together an initial set of questions and they're going to send them to me and then at your meeting, your next meeting on the 21st, they would like to appear before you. Okay. They won't be there for the full meeting. It'll be very quick. So, because, you know, we have certain amount of time that we have them for. So um, they'll provide the set of questions to me. I'll get them to you ahead of time. You can take a look and at, then you should, if there's revisions or whatever, you can just, or you have questions when they appear before you, you can have a discussion with them then. They'll appear before you to present um, the project, the project intent, the status, and also the purpose of the questions. Um, so they won't be there for very long, but then they will get that information and feedback from you. So you should be prepared ahead of the meeting. I, I will make sure I, if, you won't get them the day before, I promise. Um, in fact, they're supposed to get them to me by close of business today. Hmm. So I will get them out to you as soon as possible. You can have a um, have some time to take a look, have your questions ahead of time, have them ready for that meeting. Um, they'll take your questions or your responses to the questions and additions or edits if you have them. And then they will also be going to the Energy and Climate Action Committee at their next meeting, which is I think on the 26th. So they'll start with you, they'll go to the ECAC, and then they will be meeting with, they'll take your feedback from both committees on those questions, then they will be meeting with department heads. So at the beginning of November, um, they'll be meeting with the department heads to look over the set of questions. Are these the questions for the um, the, res the survey of residents? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. I should have been yeah, more okay. specific. Sorry. About okay. That. Good. Good. Uh, okay. Good. Good clarification. So this would be their proposed um, set of questions for a survey to the res for the residents or constituents, I should say, probably of the town, um, that we can then um, um, opine on. I guess. Correct. Great. Yeah. yeah. Super. Yep, Martha. Do I? I mean, this this seems a little sudden. I mean, at the moment, we know nothing about the consultants and nothing about what they are proposing to to study, really, other than the the general things. And this will be our introduction. But you're saying we also have to have all our questions for uh, how they survey the community. Just I mean, it uh, seems that the, it seems that's a separate topic that we haven't had any discussion about yet. So Martha, just to clarify, they are providing questions for a survey that's going to go out to the public. They're they're doing their work according to the proposal that was submitted to the town. And the town as the project manager is overseeing the implementation of that work. One of the things that they are to do is to provide, uh, is to conduct a survey of the town residents. And you all are getting an opportunity to take a look at the questions on that survey before they submit it to or um, distribute it to the community members. So you all will have an opportunity to look at those questions in advance of the meeting that are on the survey, and you will be able to weigh in and um, lend your feedback to the list of questions before it gets distributed. Yeah. I mean, it had been my understanding from our discussions previously that the process of the um, solar assessment, and I had also had the impression that that was in our work plan, uh, was that they were going to do their work on their solar siting technical assessment first and then have the community outreach. And my concern partly is that community members, I think need some information in order to uh, be able to, to give their reasoned 
uh, feedback in the best possible way. And, you know, I had envisioned that maybe we were going to have some kind of more, uh, you know, expert opinion type uh, discussions. I know, Laura, you're going to be presenting something to our meeting next time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we might want to have the battery consultant, uh, um, a battery consultant talk. I don't know whether that will be Chris's uh, technical expert or somebody else. And there might be, you know, other aspects of, of the zoning and, and so on. Uh, so it just seems a little bit compressed and sudden compared to what I had been anticipating, that's all. So um, Martha, I can say that, so the process right now is to go before you, go before the ECAC, and then to bring that before department heads, which isn't until November. So the uh -huh. timeline before it would actually even go out to the public is gonna be further down the road. Um, it's not next week and it's not even mm -hmm. right after your next meeting. Yeah. Um, so there'll be, and I think it's one of those things where they're simultaneously going to have to be doing some work. They only have six months with which to pull this all together. Mm -hmm. So they'll kind of be doing something simultaneously. So um, I think the way, my guess is that they'll probably have some information. Again, we'll have to sort of iron this out a little more specifically. When we meet, we've only talked, spoken twice, and it's just been very basic. First of it was just the first meeting was literally just reviewing the, some of the contract items and talking about some missing pieces. So, um, so that's kind of the timeline. Um, it's not going to happen next week. Great. Um, yep, yeah, uh, Laura. I think Stephanie um, sort of responded uh, based on what I was going to say. I think uh, my understanding this entire time is that you have um, a third party group of professionals who know their trade in terms of surveying a community objectively. I think it's great we get to look at some of the questions in advance, but I think this, my opinion as a member of this group is that I would never want to have any say in how they conduct their process because how you conduct your process can obviously very much influence the results. So my understanding of this survey is going to be to put, to get a pulse on how the community thinks of solar development and their values associated with that. Um, that's all. Um, before I go to Janet, um, Stephanie, do you think um, part of this set of questions or initial um, uh, back and forth with the consultant would also uh, elucidate a little bit more in terms of their process for doing the surveying, uh, in terms of just how this, how they propose to conduct the survey, um, be it you know strictly by mail or some public forums or a focus groups. It'll uh, be well. It'll be broad scale dissemination. It won't be just one specific pathway, but also they will be, um, like I said, when they appear before you on the 21st, they would um, give you some some of an overview. Yep. So they'll give you some information. They'll give you sort of the background of the survey questions and what their intention is for the, the survey. Great. Okay, uh, Janet. So, um you know, as I know the RFP went out and they've come back to you. Do they have a process already? Like this is the process that we are doing. Has that already been designed um, in terms of who they're going to talk to and forums or what, you know, what groups they think they have to work with or the community participation officers or how to do outreach to the UMass students and all, is that already like kind of a package that is already, they've already designed or is, are they in the process of designing that? And then I just, um, Second idea. Yeah, some of that I think there'll be um, there. There are a few community forums built into their proposal, um, and I think you know there's always a little bit of flexibility when you're working with the consultant if there's things that sort of come up. Um, you know, like for instance, them coming before you at this meeting. How we discussed it was well, if they don't take up a whole meeting's worth of time, then it's you know, because basically they're billing for their time, right? So um, there may be other opportunities where maybe we want to meet with some particular community groups and um, that time may come from somewhere else. It might come from a meeting with me. We might skip a week and they use that time for meeting with a group. So some of it is kind of um, 
being a little refined uh, as we go along. But I think that's part of the, you know, you can certainly um, provide some input when you um, hear from them next meeting. Do you, so they've already have a, they have a, can we look at their proposal that they sent to you that you accepted so that would give us sort of a grounding of what their plan is? Yeah, I planned on um, sending it out with the next packet. I didn't want to include it in this one because you already had en enough, um, but I can include it. Now that we've got a contract with them, I couldn't do it before the contract yeah, was signed. So now that it is, I can. The other, the other thing that comes to my mind is I think both in Athol and maybe in the UMass extension things, there is a whole list of community questions, community survey questions. So I think that would be useful for us to look at. Um, uh, and it's hard to pull, those are really long documents. I don't know if we can pull those out or just say, here's the document, the questions are at page 137. But um, so I, I, I think that'd be great to get that early so we can kind of mull on their proposed yeah. questions. The other thing I, I, I would like to do is, I'm really interested in what the community thinks and I, I kind of love community process. So if the consultants are meeting with a group or a focus group or, you know, I don't know, a church group or something, I would love to just be sort of a fly on the wall and listen to that. I, I think other members would be maybe interested yeah. too. So we I don't, can I don't think there's going to be that many separate meetings. They don't, there's not enough room in the budget for that, quite honestly. Uh -huh. So there's going to be a few public forums and several groups will be asked to um you know, we'll be given the information of when those firm forums are going to occur. And I think as far as the survey, the survey is going to go out it's going to be very broadly disseminated and i think that's an opportunity when we get the feedback they'll have to they'll probably have to compile the feedback and you can certainly have a look at the feedback once they receive it but it's not going to be there aren't going to be 25 meetings no i think so you know. and so and then are they presenting information to the community about where you know where solar could go or where the best targets are or is there going to be like a package of information or is that I think the we haven't gotten to exactly how they're going to format those forums yet. That's kind of down the road. So I think we're starting with the questions. That's I feel like we're getting a little bit of our head of ourselves with their process. I mean, we know that they're going to have forums, but how they will present that to the public, we don't have that information quite yet. Okay. We just know that they're going to, but I don't have the specifics at this point. So okay. great. Um, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to encourage people to look at that DOER survey that came out, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and I think you were all copied on an email that included a link to that, so that can give you an idea of what kinds of questions might be included on the consultants uh -huh. list. Mm -hmm. There might be other questions or fewer, I don't really know, but the other thing I wanted to say is we don't want to hit people with too many questions because if you mm -hmm. have too many questions, they're not going to bother to answer the survey. So you have to keep it kind of limited. But look at that DOER survey. I thought that was a good start. Maybe it didn't include everything, but it was a good start. Yeah, I'll just add to that because um, I, I provided some input to that DOER survey as they were sort of putting that together. Um, and um, it was certainly much better, much, much better than it was in the first rendition that we saw. Uh, it was also informed. We did make sure that they that those consultants um, had access to the survey that, um, that the Clean Energy Extension at UMass had put together. So, and I noticed in the questions that it did draw somewhat from there. Uh, that being said, uh, just so you know, the the Clean Energy Extension survey um, was. Um, a, a lengthy survey. Uh, we, you know, we we estimated that it would take folks 20, 30 minutes to fill out in its entirety. Whereas the DOER survey uh, consultants were aiming for like a, uh, I forget what they said, but like a um, five minute, seven minute, the most phone call. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and we have to sort of keep that in mind for our what what we what, what our consultants will uh, suggest for our survey as well. Uh, okay. Um, great. Okay, so that will that that then uh, we'll look forward to that at our next meeting uh, to have uh, the consultants join us for for a short period of time. And you're saying, Stephanie, that prior to that meeting, in the when the meeting package, you'll provide us with the their draft set of questions um, that they're currently considering for the survey. 
yes. uh, that we can then then read a, read ahead of time and think about some comments. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Anything else on the solar assessment? Great. Okay. So um, let's then um, spend maybe ten minutes or so, and and then get to uh, sort of the the ending end part of the meeting. Just laying, um, uh, uh, it's sort of starting to think about the our pr the primary work that we have in front of us, uh, which is really um, our work plan and and uh, uh, to develop the the bylaw uh, itself, the draft bylaw. And um, I wanted to get um, uh, sort of a better uh, a running start on that at this point, if you will. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it's sort of like the college student that's like really wanting, wants to get ready to start actually writing its their paper. Uh, and this is going to be a long paper <laughs> over a long period of time. But I want to just sort of work together at this point to have uh, to discuss and 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 uh, have a better sense of what we understand is in front of us and how this will um, uh, play out. Um, and so I sort of broke this down into two parts. One is sort of developing this outline to at least frame um, our uh, the the bylaw uh, and how are we going to sort of uh, work on developing this outline that we can then start uh, working from. Uh, and then, um, you know, looking at, okay, what is going to be our process for deliberation uh, to actually make decisions uh, and put, uh, uh, put, put specifics uh, into that outline in terms of things that we can all um, agree on or agree to disagree, but make, make decisions. Um, and so um, um, just in, in, just to guide this a little bit, um, my sense starting starting first in terms of of just how do we in my mind let's just think about outlining what's the scope of these uh, of the uh, of the bylaw and how are we going to, uh, to 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 work on that once we have an our our our, our outline then I think we can sort of start thinking about starting to put language together uh, and uh, and holding blanks of, of specifics that we have to make decisions on, but I want to sort of understand that process and how that will play out. So I think in the past, um, uh, we did reference the PVPC, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, guide uh, as potentially a good um, starting point uh, for a bylaw outline. Um, and um, I think I forget who it was, who, who's the uh, PVPC connection we have? Um, is that you, Jack? Okay. <laughs> um, I think there was some um, uh, suggestion that we might try to get an editable version of the PD, of the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Committee Commission's um, guide um, it, 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 so that we can start extracting in a more convenient way some language with regard to an outline. As I so is looking through the guide there is it's not like a, it, there's there's an outline embedded in there in certain sections that they provide some language to start start an outline but coming as a pdf it would be kind of um um uh in effect inefficient i guess to sort of create create an outline but i'm wondering whether um two things one is whether um we're good to sort of um work with the pvpc outline as a as a starting point, uh, and then second, if we um, um, can get an editable version of that, if anybody's reached out. Uh, but then third, and maybe it precedes everything, is is uh, uh, just I want to have a conversation with Chris, particularly about um, the planning the planning department, uh, and uh, and you know, are we is this something we should be doing as a committee? Uh, or um, is this something that the uh, staff at the planning department might um, take on for us as, as a staff person to sort of create this outline uh, for us? Um, but let's first hear from Stephanie. Sure. I just wanted to say that um, I worked with the PVPC on their regional climate action plan, and I know Catherine Rete very well, and I know... Um, uh, Eric Weiss, yeah. who worked, you know, who worked on the draft. So I can I can actually send them an email. In fact, I can do it right now. 
while this meeting is even happening, if you don't mind. In real time. Um, um, so I wonder if I could jump in. So oh yeah, I, and, and you mentioned you had already started. Yeah, so I, I've already. I they sent me a hard copy of this long document, and then basically I never got like a word version. And you know, I think like when I was looking at this for the first time, I thought like, oh, it's just going to be like a sample bylaw. And they're going to, you know, it won't be so hard. And so what I've actually been doing, and it's taken longer than I thought, is I've just broken into the PDF and I've copied all the stuff and I, you know, pull out these, I'm just, re, I'm basically the outline, if you look at this um, bylaw is the gray sections that are in bracket in boxes. And so I have to eliminate all the language around it. And occasionally I just I hate like lengthy, verbose legal language. I think everybody falls asleep and doesn't understand it. So sometimes I'm just tightening it up. Um, so I, I'm tr I've been fighting through that, and I and then I got a completely you know harrowing experience with you know letter A and subsection two, and you know like and so I'm trying to so I'm really just working with this kind of thing, and I, I'm hoping to I was planning to get that to the planning department this week, but I fell behind, and so. My what I can provide to Chris is basically this, and then the other thing is, is as you read through it, like the non, they're kind of like doing this great discussion, like oh, you could do this, you could do that, um, kind of thing. And so, I'm not sure how this will, you know, how we can talk about the bylaw or whatever, or the draft, or what the planning department will do, whatever I present them with. But there is, there are these like funny points where, you know, and oh, by the way. Um, the, the PVPC people told me this is basically what they took is Belchertown as a model. And, but they also, you know, they kind of open up this discussion saying you could do this, you can do that. And so I think also there's, you know, there's language, um, there's all these points to make decisions like Palmer decided solar, large scale solar can go in residential, but not their industrial districts. So they want to save that for like jobs. And um, Athol, you know, was said no to this percentage slopes and this and that. And then, you know, Shootsbury decided to section off their entire town into like six sections. You could put one field in each section to kind of like spread the pain, you know, as they perceived it or whatever, you know, whatever. So no one part of town had too many, whatever. And so those kind of decision points, you know, like the bylaw doesn't, sort of say, oh, you could do this or this or that. But I think you know, when we were looking at this issue on the planning board, um, our chair put together kind of a, I think I think Doug put this together saying, you know, this people are saying 50 feet setback, 100 foot setback, they're regulating this. And so I think that kind of chart would be useful when we're looking at the framework and then thinking, and then, you know, if you want to regulate this, it may not fit into the framework and that that's all the craft and art and pain of, you know, I'd, love, I'd happily pass along to Christine Brestrom and her, and her people, but I'm also happy to work with them on that. So I'm hoping to get to Chris next week, this thing in better, like literally better format without, a, you know, just the gray areas. And I'm writing questions in like, do you want to do this or that, or look at Shootsbury and things like that. So I don't want to present all that chatter to this group until the planning department looks at it and just says, you know, this, here's a better way to present it, or here are our ideas and here's where we, you know, kind of thing. So I'm just, I feel like I'm like a week or two behind where I thought I'd be. All right, um, Chris, and then we can discuss all that. So I think Janet, um, you know, has a lot of good ideas about this. Um, we actually had a discussion at the planning board um, several months ago where we took the I think it was the Palmer bylaw and went through it um, kind of topic by topic and said, well, Palmer is doing things this way. Some other town is doing things this way. What does Amherst think about that? And it was really interesting to have that discussion. And I would encourage this group to have that discussion about those decision points, because then we might be able to kind of maybe not all get on the same page, but at least kind of have a direction that we're going. So I would be willing to lead that kind of discussion. And um, I think we should do it sooner rather than later. The other thing is I'm looking forward to getting Janet's, um, you know, whatever she's worked up, but the planning department has, uh, you know, a lot of experience writing zoning bylaws. And, um, you know, we've just come out of writing one on floodplain. We wrote a pretty lengthy one on 
uh, accessory dwelling units last year. And we, I think we had seven bylaws that we wrote last year. But anyway, there's kind of a, I don't know, uh, there are topics that are included as topic headings. Um, you always have an intent and purpose of the bylaw. Why are you writing this? You know, and then you list below it reasons why you're writing it. Um, you have definitions. You have um, applicability. Where is this applicable? Um, you have, then you list out all your regulations or your requirements. Then you might have a section on what submittals are required to, you know, put something forth to either the planning board or the zoning board of appeals. And then you have um, a statement about enforcement, you know, who enforces this and how is it enforced and what are the penalties, et cetera. Um, then you might have, in particular for the solar um, situation, you would have a section on abandonment and decon decommissioning. So mm -hmm. those are kind of general sections. And there may be other sections that we want to interlace in this, but that was kind of my first um, go at it. Um, mm -hmm. So what we usually do is the planning department puts together a draft of whatever it is we're working on. And then we, you know, circulate it among ourselves and we get the building commissioner involved to make sure that things are sort of, um, I don't know, kosher, if you want to say that, <laughs> that they kind of fit in with the zoning regime. And then we present it to whatever group we're going to present it to. So we would come and present it to you. Of course, we would send you um, something ahead of time that you could, you know, um, edit right up or red mark or whatever you would like to do. And and Janet has experienced this and so has Jack um, working with the planning board on this kind of process. So that's kind of how I would um, recommend going ahead with this rather than having you all take pieces of it and try to write it yourselves. I suggest that there be one central point of you know, mm -hmm. of drafting, and then we bring it to you every meeting or every other meeting or however you think would be best to um, to discuss what we're doing. So that's kind of how I'm imagining it. And of course, we would involve other people as well in our staff. We'd talk to Aaron Jock, who's the wetlands administrator, and, you know, maybe others here who, who could give us good input. But um, that's kind of how I'm env envisioning this process going oh. forward. Okay, that that's really helpful and also good to hear about the, the process and the and the not only support but to some extent leadership uh, from the planning department to um, uh, work through this. My and so this clarifies a little bit to me as sort of chair of this steer working group of uh, you know how how do we you know volunteers pull pull off something like this in our spare time, whereas. Um, I'm relieved to a large extent that, you know, a lot of the writing, drafting and so forth will come to us. And I believe that it's our job uh, as, you know, ultimate, ultimate, my understanding is our job is develop a, a bylaw to recommend to you uh, and to the town. But you're saying that uh, that um, uh, that a lot of this will be drafted by your planning department for us to react to and, and provide our through that process, provide our recommendations and our feedback back to to uh, to the town. Um, I see a lot of hands, uh, um, which is, <laughs> I think okay, <laughs> which could which could take us out to the end, which I'm a little concerned about. Uh, but let me just before going into that, let me just say that you know my th I think this meshes reasonably well with what I had. Uh, proposed to to sort of start us out with which is basically let's get sort of an outline of the whole thing Chris Christine as you as you said sort of uh, and PVPC sort of lays it out and here are the sections that are typically in a in a, a, a in a any bylaw but then specifically a solar bylaw uh with um with sort of some in my mind it's like uh, with some language and sort of yellow highlights of all the key decision the, the specifications that we actually, you know, differentiate one town versus another in terms of setbacks or rules and regulations and so forth, um, uh, and that we would then, on a on a meeting by meeting basis, uh, you know, hone in on one one or two sections a meeting. Yes. yes. Uh, and try to, um, you know, with with the guidance from 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 Chris uh, or any staff people you want to bring in, uh, sort of walk us through that. 
and and have have us um, you know potentially um, opine on those on, on numbers, discuss those those specifications, maybe put stuff on hold to say let's go research and find out what other towns have done on this, uh, and then come back with some some. Uh, uh, again, I'm not sure if we're always always going to meet meet a con reach a consensus on everything, but at least some decisions. Uh, and recommendations that would then come from from this group. Um, so does that sound? Um, and, and I see this playing out, sort of pretty much starting as soon as you guys are ready, Chris and 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 Janet, yes. in terms of, of yeah. a draft. And maybe it's not the next meeting, but the next meeting mm -hmm. uh, to sort of start having a beginning sections. They don't necessarily need to go yes. in order. Yes. Maybe it makes sense to do some of the definitions at the end or something. Uh, but at least to to start. Um, uh, actually looking at some language and, and knowing sort of the, the decision points that we need to make. Um, I would say that I would maybe next week uh, or next next meeting, uh, I thought it would be helpful to have just a very high level conversation amongst us just to air our various different issues and concerns uh, and, and, and uh, um, principles, if you will, of just a high level discussion as we embark on this endeavor of of um, uh, of um, sort of some of our high level uh, principles that we want to try to uphold uh, in this bylaw, uh, and recognizing and, and being transparent and recognizing sort of the tra the trade offs uh, that are inherent in this type of uh, regulatory scheme, um, and uh, obviously not make decisions, but just so we all sort of uh, aware of of uh, the various dimensions of uh, concerns, impacts, and principles that we are trying to uphold as we move forward. Uh, and so if, if people think that's a good idea, we'll maybe have a brief discussion on that at the next meeting uh, before we launch into, into the language. Um, let, me, uh, let me go with uh, uh, Stephanie, Jack, Martha, and Laura, uh, and then we'll try to close out with some uh, planning for next time and public input. Stephanie, muted, you're muted. Sorry, very quick procedurally, I just wanna um, remind you all that you are representing committees very specifically. So when you get drafts, you should be taking them back to your committees to get mm -hmm. their input and review and then bringing the comments back from your committees as well. Good, thank you for that, yeah, that's important. Okay, uh, Jack? Yeah, I, I, I figure that uh, Chris, um, you know, has the most experience of anyone here with the bylaws and was hoping that she would <laughs> take the lead. But I was wondering who the point person might be within your staff. And also I was wondering about, you know, uh, it seems like we had, when I was on the planning board, we kind of struggled with the uh, CRC kind of uh, steering the boat versus, you know, the your department versus the planning board sort of thing. And I was just wondering about CRC input and when that comes, when, you know, if ever that will come up. That's a great question. Yeah, go, go ahead, Chris. I'm not envisioning that we would bring anything to the CRC until we had something fleshed out. I feel like they don't really have a role until, you know, we know what we're doing. So at this point it would be too much of a ping pong game, you know, if we were to try to do this with the CRC. So I'm thinking the planning department staff will work with the solar bylaw working group and come up with a solid draft. And then eventually it'll go to the CRC to make sure that they are aware of what we're doing. But, you know, in general, I think they're aware of what we're doing. So I don't feel like we need to have constant input from them. And they're also very busy doing other things. Okay, let me, let me, I do want to be uh, conscious of public input, and we uh, messed up on that last time in terms of going over time. So can I ask okay. Martha and Laura uh, just to be real quick, and then we can move to to, to um, public input? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I I just fully agree with, with Chris taking the lead in the planning department, uh, making a good outline, Dwayne, everything you said, and stress that we should go section by section starting soon, and maybe suggest that we all review the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's uh, document before next time. That's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. One final question is, um, when do we expect to have the draft outlined by next meeting for us to review? 
I guess the question is when Janet plans to get it to Christine so we can have something to work with. Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, if maybe you're too far into it, Janet, but if it's if it's still helpful for Stephanie or someone to reach out to Eric or um I think I think Catherine. I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Yeah. I mean, I I I I think I'm okay and I can just pass it. To, I think I'll um, my goal I have a we um my goal is to do finish up whatever I'm doing next week, hand it to Chris and you know, that's it. So, um yeah. So I don't think it's that helpful at this point because I, I think I have everything sort of in Word. I've deleted all the excess language and then, you know, it's still a little ugly, but it's um, it, it's in shape. Um, I'm sorry, Laura, I interrupted you, though. No, I just want to know timing. That's all. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, I think next time if we can maybe see the state of the outline and talk yeah. a little bit about the, the principles that we're going to be um, uh, keeping in, 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 in our minds moving forward. Uh, my sense is that would be good for next meeting and then the following meeting, uh, maybe have uh, the, the first uh, section or two that for us to sort of um, dive into, if that works out with the planning department in terms of staffing and so forth. But let me um, let me uh, just say we do have a schedule for the next meeting. I think now we're going basically every other week on Fridays one to three. Um, uh, so I think we're good with that. I think we're good with the agenda items. Uh, I think we've covered that. I've written some down from the course of the meeting. So Stephanie, I wouldn't mind um, seeing if there's any public comment um, before um, we're too much over time. Yeah. Okay, if anyone from the public is interested in making a comment or asking a question, please digitally, uh, digitally raise your hand. Lenore, can you unmute? Um, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm in transit. On I'm on a phone with body reception, so forgive me um, if if even what I'm saying uh, is missing point. But anyway, thank you for pooling together your care, concern, your expertise, and your time. I just want to highlight a couple of things that I heard. Um, is is to just it, it's so tricky because you're a committee in Amherst in this little town dealing with something that is a regional and global issue. So I'm just reminding us of the obvious of not working in isolation. So when you were talking about the watershed and Shootsbury, um, Shootsbury is a wonderful neighbor to like bring in here. They have redrafted their bylaw um, and there's a lot to learn from, from them and also from the other towns, of course, that you were talking about. Um, and, and the other, piece about not working in isolation is there's a lot going on on the state level, a lot changing, a lot of movement around solar. Um, and so just for us to keep in touch with that, because that's going to wind up impacting, um, maybe not today, but in, in the future, which is what you're writing this bylaw for. Um, and, and I wanted to make a note, um, you were talking about uh, how grasslands are um, close to forests in their uh, function of filtering and cleaning water um, and et cetera. But that's not entirely true in everything that I've studied on this issue. If you were to put it in a scale in a hierarchy, older forests do the best job of that. But of course, we don't have any of those. Evolving forests are next. And we sort of have those. Most of our forests are working forests that would be next. Grasslands would be next after that, unless you're talking about the old plains that the buffalo roams, which you're not. Um, and then man-made plantings, which is what you're talking about in terms of pollinator habitats, which is wonderful, and creating that vegetation around solar rays. But that is not anything like what a forest can do, because as soon as you disrupt the soil in any kind of building, as Jack was saying, when you don't have that ground cover, you, you're disturbing everything above and below that, not to mention the most important part of the forest in terms of the communication is the mycorrhizal fungal networks. And that works in all of this 
not only filtering water, but in our resilience to drought or resilience to floods, you have to assume things are just going to get worse. So there's this intelligence that guides these ecosystems that is very different than when we think, okay, well, we'll just plant some trees and make up for it. It's not the same thing. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is um, I agree that it would really be good to have more details on what went wrong in, in different towns all over the state, even though they might be different from ours, just so that you can have that in mind. You know, what, what actually, what were the things in Williamsburg? Because, because, because just because the state requires certain um, procedures doesn't mean that they're being carried out. So that's just the other thing that I wanted to bring up and I will stop talking now and thank you very much. Thank you. Lenore. Jenny, did you have a question? Okay. So I think that's it for public comment. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Okay, I still do, uh, before we close, I, I see Laura and, and Janet and Chris's uh, hands still up. Are those still valid hands? Yep, okay. Um, yep, Janet. Um, it occurred to me when I, we were talking about the bylaw and the sections, it would, might be really helpful to have us um, get a list of what we see or maybe Chris sees, the planning department sees at key decision points, like, you know, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of language is just the language, but, you know, what are key decision points that we need to sort of decide or make recommendations as a group? And um, that might be helpful to frame the discussion. Like, what are things that we have to, at some point, just deal with? And what information do we need? You know, if we had that list, then we can think, oh, we need information that will help us understand this or make a decision. So I thought that might be helpful. Great. Yeah, my thought, and maybe I'm wrong, but my thought is we do that as we dive into section by section. Because uh, I think every section is going to have some of those decision points and and uh, potentially further research we want to do uh, mm -hmm. to to reach reach those decisions. Um, Chris, oh, I just wanted to say that I think um, you know it's good to look at what went wrong in various places so we can put in regulations to avoid the things that went wrong or put in guard rails, but I also feel like we need to look at what went right. And there are probably mm -hmm. installations that were done well and didn't have, you know, major problems. And I think we should try to find those examples as well. So we could learn from them because they may have done things in a way that we wouldn't necessarily know about, or, you know, I, I wouldn't know about, and I would like to know, I would like to find out what went right in certain places that turned out well, that's all. Great, thank you, yep. Um, okay, um, just before we sign off, just for um, uh, uh, for next, uh, next meeting, um, the 21st of October, um, Laura, you were on agenda for a, um, presentation, formal or informal, however you'd like to make it, but on, uh, on, on elucidate a little bit from your experience uh, and knowledge of, of sort of the economic drivers of solar development. Um, I'm also just with, with what Chris just said, whether if there's any guidance you can give us on, on uh, projects, projects we might reach out to that have, have sort of been good uh, examples of, of uh, at least in terms of construction process have, have gone well. But I think the main purpose was sort of this uh, economic driver of of what um, uh, you know what what uh, what are solar developers looking for needing to make uh, projects be able to move forward economically. Does that sound okay, Laura? We appreciate it. That thank you. Um, and then we will also uh, have the um, uh, solar consultants with us, um, and. Um, uh, and start on the um, some discussion on the uh, high level principles with regard to as we go into this uh, process of of uh, begin, uh, developing the bylaws and maybe talk a little bit about the 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 um, process again with the uh, with the planning staff um, and timeline on that in terms of getting getting uh, sections 
and the outline and sections. And maybe Jen, if 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 you or Chris are able to sort of present at that at next the next meeting of sort of the outline uh, that we have uh, as our starting point, that would be really helpful. Okay, excellent. Enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon and a long weekend. Uh, looks like a nice weekend. Uh, so enjoy and thank you everybody for um, for your, all the work on this. Okay, Bye. thank you. I, I, I hereby adjourn the meeting. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you.